This module is basically going to be a crash course in chemistry. Now, a lot of people get really scared when they hear the word chemistry, but I personally think chemistry is a lot of fun. In fact, it's probably my very favorite science out of all the sciences. Um, we're just gonna cover the basics here. And in fact, a lot of what we talk about today may be things that you've already learned if you've taken a good physical science course. So again, we're gonna kinda um, cover the basics of, of atoms and elements and molecules here in the next couple of days so that we can then hit the pieces of chemistry that are gonna affect our study of biology this year. When we start talking about chemistry, uh, we have to start talking about the atom. Um, the atom is the basic building block of all matter. And if you have, let's say, for example, a chunk of iron and you cut it in half and you cut it in half again and you cut it in half again and you cut it in half again, the smallest piece that you can have that still maintains all the characteristics of that chunk of iron is the atom. Now, the structure of the atom contains a number of different subatomic particles or small particles but there are three main ones, and those are the three that you're expected to know. The first is a positively charged proton. The second is a neutral neutron. That means it doesn't have any charge on it at all. And both of those are contained inside the nucleus of the atom. Now, the proton and the neutron have almost all of the weight in the atom, almost all of the mass in the atom. There is another subatomic particle, and only this subatomic particle is one that orbits or uh, kind of rotates around the um, nucleus of the atom, and that's called the electron. The electron has a negative charge to counterbalance the positive charge of the protons inside. Now, the protons and neutrons are all jammed together in the nucleus, and I said they are what has almost all of the mass of the atom. The electrons do have some mass, but it's so small in comparison, it would actually take, I believe it's 1,847 electrons to make up the mass of one proton. So you can see that the mass of the electrons are actually going to be negligible. So the, the uh, nucleus is very, very dense. And these electrons that are located in these orbits, um, we tend to call them orbits, but it, it's really better to think of it in three dimensions and to think of it more uh, as an electron cloud. Um, the pictures that you see in your book, especially in this module, they're gonna look like uh, planets with moons circling around them. And although that's the way we draw them because that's the easiest way to understand the structure of them, in reality, the electrons are, are really surrounding the nucleus and buzzing around this nucleus, almost kind of like a hyperactive fly. And they're kind of buzzing around the nucleus and they can be in any spot in that cloud outside of the nucleus. Now the electrons are so far away from the nucleus that if the nucleus of an atom was as big as the period at the end of a sentence in your textbook, the first level of electrons would be as far away as the outer edges of a baseball stadium. So there's a lot of empty space inside of an atom. Now, in order for um, atoms to be neutral, you have to have the same number of protons as you do electrons, because like I said, protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. Um, the way that these electron clouds work around the outside is that you're allowed to have as many as two electrons in the first energy level, and then you can have more energy levels after that. You can have eight electrons in this energy level, and then you can go out and have even more electrons in the next energy level after that. Okay, so basic structure of an atom. Um, the important thing about the number of protons and the number of electrons, besides the fact that they're always going to be equal to each other, and in fact that's so important, let's actually get that up here. The number of protons is going to be equal to the number of electrons in an atom, but this number of protons is also going to determine the identity of the atom. So, um, for example, all atoms of carbon have six protons and six electrons. All um, atoms of 
hydrogen have one proton and one electron. All atoms of helium have two protons and two electrons. All atoms of oxygen have eight protons and eight electrons. So that number is, is the same all of the time. It doesn't change. And again, if you have an atom, the number of protons and number of electrons are going to be equal. Now, you may remember from physical science, again, that we can gain or lose electrons. We'll talk about that a little bit, um, a little bit later. Um, so you can gain and lose electrons, but then you no longer have an atom, then you have what's called an ion instead. So for an atom, remember that the number of protons is gonna be equal to the number of electrons, and that's what determines the atom's identity, and it's also what determines all of the atom's properties. Okay, now if I have a whole group of atoms together, then I have an element. Now, within that element, there can be some differences among some of the atoms. So C stands for carbon, and you may be familiar with the periodic table, which um, has all, there's a picture of it in your book, has all kinds of, um, all of the known elements to man on there. Um, and so each one of the elements has a one or two letter abbreviation that will give us the name, stand for the name of that element. A lot of them are pretty self-explanatory, like C is for carbon and H is for hydrogen. Uh, some of them don't look so normal, so if you have something like Na, which is actually for sodium, that's actually derived from the Latin name uh, for sodium in place of the English name. Okay, so this represents an element, which is a collection of all of these, of a whole lot of atoms together of the same type, with the same number of protons. However, some of these specific atoms within the element may have different numbers of neutrons, and you can tell how many neutrons they will, they will have um, when we write the name of the atom this way. So most atoms that are naturally occurring are carbon-12 atoms. And what that means is that this number right here is the number of protons, plus the number of neutrons that are in the nucleus of that specific atom. Now, as I told you before, carbon always has six protons in it. That's always true for carbon. Um, but this 12 is the number of protons plus neutrons. So if six of them are protons, that means that the other six then are going to be neutrons, all right? You've probably heard of, um, radiocarbon dating or carbon-13 dating, and carbon-13 is a much more rare form of carbon that um, occurs in nature as well. And a carbon-13 atom will also have six protons in it because all carbons have six protons. But the total mass of this atom is 13, so that means I'm going to have seven neutrons in this atom. So when I write the name of an atom with a number after it, that tells me that I have a very specific atom. It tells me exactly what the makeup of that atom is. But if I write the name of it, of it like this, this just tells me it's, it's a generic um, atom of carbon. And so we, all I know about this one for sure is that it's gonna have six protons. And I should mention that these also are gonna have six electrons because all atoms, like we said up here, number of protons and number of electrons are gonna be the same. So let's do another example to make sure that you understood that. Hydrogen is an element that can be made up of a lot of different types of hydrogen atoms. And in your book, you'll notice that um, these different types are called isotopes of one another. So those are atoms that have the same number of protons, but they will have differing numbers of neutrons. Now hydrogen has, all hydrogen atoms are going to have one proton in them. So it doesn't matter what number comes after the, the name hydrogen, I know that each one of them is going to have one proton. At this point in the game, I don't expect you to know how to determine uh, what the number of protons um, is what I do want you to know though is if I tell you um, that you have a hydrogen atom and I tell you how many protons you should be able to determine the number of neutrons so if it's a hydrogen one and it has one proton and this number is the sum of protons plus neutrons how many neutrons will it have well if it has to add up to one that means that it's not going to have any neutrons in it 
How many electrons will it have? Well, if it has one proton, it must have one electron because that's the protons and electrons are the same for all atoms. How about if I have a hydrogen two atom? Um, again, how many protons are there? Always one because all hydrogen atoms have one proton. But if it's a hydrogen two, that means protons plus neutrons must add up to two. So that means that I must have one neutron. And again, protons, electrons are equal, so I'll have one electron. Finally, how about hydrogen three? Because all of these are the naturally occurring um, hydrogen. Um, this is the most common one, but these other ones exist as well. So if I have hydrogen three and it has one proton, how many neutrons are there? Hopefully you said two, because two plus one makes three, so it will have two neutrons. How many electrons will it have? Yep, if it has one proton, then it's just gonna have one electron. So all three of these also would be considered isotopes of hydrogen. All right, so that is the basics of what an atom looks like, how atoms can vary from one to another within an element. Um, you do need to know that if I have a collection of atoms um, that all have the same number of protons, then I'm going to have an element, okay? So remember this piece because I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this little part of this diagram in the next video, I'm gonna add another section to it. Okay, so atom, a collection of atoms with the same number of protons is gonna make an element. Now there's over, well over a hundred different types of elements that we are commonly, that we are aware of right now, but there are six what you're, the author of your textbook calls biologically important elements, and they are in almost um, every living cell that is going to exist. And those six biologically important elements are, um, you can think of it as CHNOPs. So C-H-N-O-P-S. It sort of looks like chops, but we gotta get the N in there someplace. And it's easiest to pronounce if I stick it right there. So it's CHNOPs. And those six elements then would be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Okay, so you, I do want you to have memorized what the six biologically important elements are. If you remember the word chinops, then you'll have all of the letters and then you'll just have to remember uh, what each one of those letters stands for. Okay, so we will continue our discussion of chemistry a little bit deeper the next time.